All righty. Um, so I guess we can just go ahead and jump in. So today we're going to be looking at UAV imagery in ArcGIS Pro. And just a couple reminders, please stay on mute. If you have any problems, you can type them into the chat window. And then we have a couple helpers who can either message you directly or answer to the entire group. If it seems like a few other people are having the same issues. And ArcGIS Pro can sometimes be a little bit interesting to try and get the hang of. If you get behind at any point in the workshop, don't worry. The exercise guide is online. You can follow along there. You can also just follow along in the slides or with us as we go through the demonstration, if that's easier for you. Um, and again, exercise guide is there for you to have, and you can feel free to use your own drone imagery later on and practice this at home. All right, so let's get started. So we just talked about a couple of the reminders. Um, in addition to the chat window, if you have a question, we're gonna have a bio break in the middle of this workshop. So we can always do a quick Q&A then. And we'll also hopefully have some time at the end to do a little bit more of a Q&A. But yeah, just feel free to use the chat window when you have a question. Um, so before we get started, I'll just give a brief introduction to myself. My name is Chippy Kislik. I'm going to be a fourth year PhD student in Maggie Kelly's lab. And I use drones to look at algae and aquatic plants that are in the river up in the Klamath River of Northern California. And I use a lot of remote sensing and high quality um, water quality data to look at that. So I'll let Maggie introduce herself as well. Hey everybody, I'm Maggie. I'm uh, at Berkeley. I'm a professor and a cooperative extension specialist. And I do work um, across mapping technology extremely broadly, but I'm really into UAVs right now. And I do work looking at um, forests and wetlands and urban environments and some public health stuff. And um, yeah, I'm just super into maps. Thanks, awesome. Chippy. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, so now we'd love to hear about you if you feel comfortable. Um, in the chat window, go ahead and write your name, affiliation, and comfort level with ArcGIS Pro. So we're saying one is maybe you haven't used it that much and five is pretty comfortable. So for example, I would say Chippy, UC Berkeley grad student, maybe three or four. All right, great. Yeah, and it's no problem if you've never used ArcGIS Pro before or if you're pretty familiar with it. Um, this introductory webinar is kind of supposed to introduce you to ArcGIS Pro, but also if you have a lot of experience with ArcGIS Pro, feel free to jump ahead in the exercise guide and work at your own pace. Um, but yeah, it looks like we have a pretty nice range of skill sets here. So really exciting. Um, great to see where everybody's from. <laughs> okay, perfect. Well, yeah, keep on typing away in the chat window. Um, really excited to see you all here. So just as a reminder, if anyone hasn't found the data, you can just go, I'll give you a quick look really quickly. Can you all still see my screen? Yeah. Okay, perfect, thanks. Um, so yeah, just go up to the Drone Camp website. You can drop into um, the Tuesday session. So we're right here in processing UAV images. And you just scroll down a little bit and you see the slides, the exercise guide, and the data. And also right here we have some homework questions if people are interested. If you're in a class, you're getting this for credit and your professor or TA have said, go through some of the homework questions, you can look at this document and fill them out and send them to your professor or TA. So now that you know where the data are, go ahead and download those and unzip them onto your desktop. You can put them wherever you want. We just recommend the, des the desktop as kind of the easiest access um, location point. And you'll notice that the overall folder that you're downloading is zipped up. And so you'll have to unzip that. So if you've never done that before, basically all you do is you right click on the place with the zipper and you'll see seven zip or unzip click on that, um, say extract files, click OK, and that should 
open up your files so that they're not closed in that zipper anymore. Once you do that, you actually have to go into the folders again where you see these five um, data files and you have to unzip the raw imagery folder as well. So this is really just used to compress the folders to make them a bit smaller so they were easier to download. So just remember, do the double zip, the, the bigger folder on the outside and the raw imagery folder on the inside. Otherwise, we won't be able to access any of our data as we go through the workshop. So hopefully people are able to unzip everything, put it on their desktop. And once you do that, you'll see that there are five different files in this folder. So the raw imagery, which are just the drone images that Sean took at his father's ranch a couple weeks ago. Final products, which are model outputs that we're providing to you to kind of help speed up the process. Um, because sometimes running a tool in ArcGIS Pro can take a while. So we're providing those digital surface model, digital terrain model, and ortho mosaic to you. The ground control points. So we have a CSV file, which gives you the lat and long, so the location of each of these points, where Sean put out that checkerboard ground control point and took a GPS location of it to get really high accuracy. And then we also created a shape file of points. So these are just the actual points um, that show up within the map. And that's more just for visual representation of these ground control points. There's a report after we click the block adjustment process. So that's kind of just aligning and putting the images in place. We'll see how well we do. Um, as Maggie showed, there were a couple of those images from our, block, from our block, block adjustment report. So we'll dive more into detail there. And then there's a map package, which is basically an ArcGIS Pro file that you can double click, open up, and you'll see a lot of the saved imagery that um, I've already run through previously. And this is after the adjustment process, again, provided just to save time so you don't have to wait 45 minutes for your tool to run. All right, so hopefully in this amount of time, you have everything downloaded and unzipped. So drones, all of you are here for different reasons. Most of us really love drones, just like Kermit the Frog. Sometimes we'll dream about them. But some people don't like drones. Um, as you see in this image here, there are actually locations where you're not allowed to fly drones. So this is just a quick reminder. Be careful when you're flying. Look out for restrictions. Um, use your apps that will help you stay in tune with the regulations. Um, but have fun. Drones are really awesome. And the reason we wanted to teach you this workshop in ArcGIS Pro with drone data is because it's fairly easy to use. You don't have to figure out how to code to do these processes. Once you figure out ArcGIS yeah. Pro, it's relatively easy to follow along with the steps. ArcGIS Pro is really good for smaller drone projects. So we're looking at 88 images in this project. If you're looking at more than 100 or 200, especially closer to the 1,000 photo range, you might want to use a program like PIX4D. And although it might be hard to get a license for that, um, you can look at some of the steps that are given in the other workshop that's happening right now. If you want to look at those later, the recording will be online. So definitely recommend kind of comparing your outputs from ArcGIS Pro to the PIX4D outputs if you want to do that workshop on another day at your own pace. Another great thing about ArcGIS is that it has integration into a huge data set online. Thousands and thousands of files that are provided to you that you can use. And this is called Living Atlas. This is just a really big database all online. It's connected directly to ArcGIS Pro. And we're going to explore one of those thousands of files today. So those are kind of cool files to compare your drone imagery against. If you're ever interested in looking at forest cover, for example, we'll check that out today. The learning goals for today, we're going to be looking at the ArcGIS Pro user interface. So a lot of you, if you're new, this is going to be a great introduction to the software. We're going to be looking at the drone imagery metadata, which just means the camera, the sensor, the GPS location, all of that information that's stored within the imagery itself. We'll look at the drone processing workflow. We'll even conduct a really quick vegetation health analysis, as you can see here on the right. 
that we'll talk about in just a moment. And then we're going to create and export a map like the one you see on this right side. And for credit, as I mentioned again, check out some of these red question marks within the exercise and you can submit those to your professor or TA if you're taking this in a class. Steps for today's exercise, explore the metadata, look at ArcGIS Pro and Living Atlas. We're going to be creating a new orthomosaic workspace. We're going to be looking at ground control points, and we're not going to actually be computing those. You can do that on your computer at another time, but we'll go through how you're going to be able to do that. Learn how to stitch images like this little guy into an orthomosaic and into digital surface and terrain models. We'll look at those products. We'll look a little bit at vegetation health with a band ratio using the red, green, and blue bands. And then we're going to create a map and export that to send to all your friends. So an orthomosaic, just as a quick refresher, Maggie did a great job at explaining this. Basically in this workshop, we're going to be taking 88 drone images. They're all separate, like the ones you see here. And we're going to be putting them into a geometric model that's able to adjust and align all these photos, stitch them up into one single ortho mosaic or one single photo which has accurate positions within the map. So the geometric distortion is corrected and the color balance is applied. So you don't have really bright photos on one side and really dark photos on the other. It should be pretty balanced. And the way that this geometric model works is it's just taking a lot of the metadata that we're going to explore in just a moment. So the drone you're flying, the camera you're using, the GPS location, the orientation of the photo itself, and it's correcting for all of these parameters to be able to stitch it into this one image. And this is just another schematic of how you create that ortho mosaic. So within ArcGIS Pro, you open up that mapping workspace, which we'll do in a moment. You add in all of your images, so the 88 images we're working with. We're not gonna do a quick adjustment, but you could on your own the full block adjustment using the adjust tool, which takes about 45 to 50 minutes with this project. We're not going to click that button, but we will explore the outputs. Then we'll look at the digital elevation model that's created in the ortho mosaic. And then we'll do a little bit of analysis and visualization. So using that vegetation analysis that we'll talk about on the next slide. And again, the, the ground control points, they're not actually mandatory but you can add them after you click adjust the first time. And then that will help make your overall ortho mosaic a little bit more accurate. So the vegetation health index we're going to be using today is called visual atmospheric resistant index. And this is really awesome. So if any of you have ever used the normalized difference vegetation index, NDVI, really common vegetation health index in remote sensing. This is sort of a red, green, blue equivalent of that, so you don't actually need any multispectral imagery. Of course, multispectral imagery is perhaps better to be able to assess plant health um, for terrestrial studies, but the red, green, blue, this is going to work pretty well to see where we have our healthy vegetation in green and some of the, the less healthy objects or vegetation in red. And here's the, the basic idea of this index is that we're highlighting the green because healthy vegetation often reflects in the green light and absorbs in the red and blue wavelengths. So we're highlighting this green and we're taking out the red and the blue. So that's going to really make this green reflectance value pop. And that's what we're going to be doing a little bit later today. So our study area, we're looking at El Dorado County, which is pretty close to Lake Tahoe. And it's down here at this red point. And it, it's a really beautiful area with oak, manzanita, and ponderosa pine. However, there was a drought which kind of led to bark beetle infestation. So within especially the center of our study area, we're going to see some of that drought take place and some of the bark beetle infestation with dead trees. So keep that in mind. And here you can see this is the way that Sean was able to fly the drone at Holding Pen, which is his 
father's ranch up in El Dorado County. So this is the, the flight plan that he used. And we're gonna explore this a little bit later. All right, so hopefully everybody has been able to download all of the data from the Drone Camp program website. Hopefully they have the exercise guide pulled up. So that's just, should look something like this. Um, you should probably have it in a Google Drive version. So have that pulled up. And we're just gonna start going through that. So at this point, we're gonna tra transition to the hands-on workshop portion of the of this overall webinar. So now we're gonna open ArcGIS Pro. So I'm just gonna close my screen. And if this is new to anybody, no worries. You just go down to your start menu here and you click in ArcGIS Pro. Once you find that, you just click on that and wait for it to open. And so hopefully everyone can still see my screen. You can see the ArcGIS Pro loading. Is that right? Okay, um, let's hope that everybody can see my screen. So we're here in ArcGIS Pro and if you're following along in the guide, the exercise guide, we're down on page two. So if everyone can hear me, just use the little green check mark and check that in the participants window. Perfect, okay, great. Just wanted to make sure you could see my screen and, and hear everything. So again, we're on page two of the exercise guide. Your ArcGIS Pro should open up and look like this. You should have the download, the data downloaded onto your desktop and unzipped. So we're under new, blank templates, and you see this map here. If you click on that, this window should pop up. So we're gonna give our new project a name. Let's call it Holding Pen RGB Stitch. Feel free to call it whatever you want. And we're just gonna save it. So using this browse button on the right side, we're gonna find a new area to save it. So I wanna put it in the desktop, Drone Camp 2020, where I saved my data, stitching, and I'll click one more time into it. And this is the folder I'm gonna save it in. So I'll just click okay. And once you're ready, make sure that this is checked. So create a new folder for this project. Once you're ready, you can just click okay and this should open up your new map document. So it may take a couple of moments and in a second, I'm gonna have, if Maggie wants to, she can, um, kind of voice over a little bit of our exploration of ArcGIS Pro as I navigate through it. Sure thing. Great. Yeah, so. Do you want me to start now? Yeah, sure, that'd be great. Oh, okay, great. So for those of you who haven't done Pro yet, it's just so much better than desktop. It's gonna take a bit to get used to, but once, you're, once you've switched, it's just great. We love it. So this top part here, um, where she's got the mouse. This is called the ribbon and this is um, organized in a um, much better fashion than in desktop and it really kind of walks you through the steps that you might want to do um, in an order. So the project is where project, the first tab is project, that's where you're going to want to save stuff or open stuff or, you know, that's the, the basic information. Um, Map is all the general uh, tools you're going to need to navigate around your map, explore, zoom in, add new base maps, add data, um, add some preset templates if you've created them, select, measure, all this stuff. Interact with your, with your um, map. And the, the map is a um, window. This has a map where we're going to be adding data. Uh, the table of contents looks very similar to uh, desktop and with the drawing order, but it has some more information about you can toggle between the list or what where the data comes from or um, lots of more lots of better ways to interact with your data. Sorry, a truck's going by. The next tab over is your insert, and we're going to use this a little bit later on. This is where we're going to create things like 
new maps and layouts if we want to make a proper map and we'll go into this a bit later. Um, the next tab over is your analysis tab and this is where all of the good stuff is going to happen. And uh, the uh, Esri's really done a nice job of trying to streamline their tools. You know, they basically had 30 years of accumulated tools built off of multiple different workflows for doing things. So you could, you know, if you did a search for clip, there'd be sort of 10 different ways you could clip. Anyway, they streamlined all of this and they've um, built some, some nice go-to tools at the top. But if you can't find what you need, you could always find it if you, you click on tools. This will open up a new geoprocessing um, panel here where you can search for some of your favorites. You can also save them. You can use them. Um, do you want to dock this um, particular guy so we can talk about? Yeah, so, so this is great. So here's your geoprocessing tools. Can I go into catalog a little bit too, Chippy? Sure. So, yeah, if you go down to the bottom of your geoprocessing um, dock, you'll see catalog. And so instead of interacting like in desktop with constantly adding stuff and not remembering where anything was, this catalog panel is going to be your go-to. It You'll see it's populated by default with maps. Those are going to be the maps that you've already seen. Toolboxes, these are things that, that you, if you create your own, you're going to, they'll be docked there. Um, databases, styles, folders are going to be particularly important. Folders are all the, the, the databases that you can draw from in this particular um, example. And you're going to add new folders if you need to. Let's say you have databases in more than one place. You're going to add new folders on that insert, insert tab over on um, the left where we were um, just for, or you can add a folder connection there. This will all become a bit clear. And at first it seems a bit overwhelming, but trust me, it's going to make your life so much easier. So we were with analysis. That's great. So these are all some of the tools. They're organized in terms of some, some go-to stuff that you might want to do with vector data, go-to stuff that you might want to do with raster data. Um, you'll also see on the right and the ribbon up above, there are such things as network analysis. These are all going to depend on what license you have eventually, but these are some of the go-to tools that Esri thinks you might need for network analysis, for the geostatistical analysis like Kriege and other things, for business anal analysis in case you're, you're, you have um, that in your license. And then one more, you get to raster functions, and this is a real improvement in Pro. This is where if you want to do quick analysis of raster data and particularly imagery, they've really streamlined this and this is lightning fast. These are processes that will only do, be done on what raster is viewed in your map and it does not save this. You have to save it if you want to keep this, but it's great for doing experimentation. Did this NDVI work? Just run it really fast. You can also do all of this in raster calculator and geoprocessing, but if you're working with raster, I really recommend you check out the um, raster uh, processing. Great. What else do I want to show you? View, go to the view tab. So this is where um, you can do a lot of um, organization about how everything looks, where your table of contents is going to be, where your catalog is going to view is going to be, how you're going to organize your, your, your workspace in general. If you go to edit, for those of you who remember editing in desktop, you are going to love editing in Pro. They've made a ton of differences. We're not going to ex explore this much, but I encourage you, especially if you're working with vector data, points, lines, polygons, and you need to do editing of them. Um, it's fantastic. I really love it. Um, one more to the right is um, imagery. This just highlights all the tools that you might want to use if you're dealing with um, image data. And then finally, share. This is a real innovation for Pro. This is how they're trying to get us to use 
uh, cloud storage um, better. And so you can create traditional layouts and export them as PDFs, but you can also push your data up to your portal. And I'll show you what that means in a minute. So all of the data you're creating on your, on your project, you can share through ArcGIS Online so that others in your uh, group can collaborate with you and use that data. You can create uh, web maps and web apps extremely easily through this share function. But then at the end of the day, if you just want to make a nice map, which we're going to do, you go all the way to the right on share and you just export it as a PDF or JPEG or whatever else you want. So the ribbon is organized from left to right, from getting your map to sharing your data and sharing your map. And you're going to explore some of this um, today. One more thing I wanted to show you about, if you go back to the catalog, screen down here and you see at the top it says project that's everything local portal is going to be everything in your in your content in arcgis online um there's my contact yeah this is groups that have i've that i've shared with so chippy and i teach a class espo 164 so a lot of our stuff is shared through that um project everything in the portal. You can search who else has contributed. And then finally, Living Atlas. And that's where all of the curated data that Esri wants us to use is available to us. So you no longer have to go out, download something, bring it into your desktop, open it up, use it. It's, it's much more seamless. There are some hiccups, of course, but I really recommend um, if you're an Esri person, switch to Pro immediately because they're going to phase out desktop anyway in the next few years. And Pro really makes your life a lot better. Anything I missed? That was really good. That was super comprehensive. Very fast. <laughs> and we'll get more into it um, as we go. Okay. No, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, the only other button I want to yeah. show everybody is, yeah, you can get to the save just right up here. Right. Great. Yeah. So that's great. So go ahead and click that. Save your project. Yeah, anything else, Maggie? For no, the... but I'm going to go through some of these comments here just to make sure um, there's still some people downloading. Um, there's somebody hey. answered another question. Great. Chippy, um, could you show how people how to log into their portal? <clears throat> sure. So you just go to this area up top where it might say signed out or not logged in. Um, and then you just click sign in and then you have to get into your AGOL account. Um, there are instructions in the exercise guide. So there should be a link to like more detailed instructions just in case um, people haven't been able to do that in the exercise zero. Any other questions you should answer right now? There's a question from Missy that I think Shane could um, point to. I'm not sure, Missy, what, which, what you're using. Ah, good. Brad also says, and I totally agree with him, save often, save early, save often. <laughs> he says, crashes and lost progress make me cry. I completely agree. Yeah, so Chippy just showed you where the save is. And if, yeah, and if you've closed, so let's say that we close the catalog or geoprocessing, then you just go back up into the view tab, the ribbon up here, and then you can go to catalog pane. And then if you want to pin that so it doesn't disappear again, you can just click that up and yeah, pin that right there. Um, and same goes for contents. If that disappears, this is your contents pane on the left. You can just click on view contents. All right, great. So now we're on page, the bottom of page three in our exercise guide, if you're following along. We're just on 1.6. So in the top ribbon, go to map, just up here, that one on the far left. And we're just going to add in a new base map. So map, go over to base map, click that down, and you have a bunch of options. So I'm just going to click on imagery just for fun. Feel free to choose whichever one you want. This is more just a little bit of exploratory time before we dive into the data. 
So here's just how you get a new background map. You can click that on and off using this little check mark in your contents pane right here. And now we're going to explore a little bit of the Living Atlas files. So we're going to look at a big global forestry data set. So let's say your catalog went away. We're just going to go up to the top ribbon, View and Catalog Pane. That's going to pop that back up. And if you're in Project, just switch right over to Portal, as Maggie showed us a couple moments ago. And if you're in My Content, just switch all the way over to the right into Living Atlas. And again, make sure you're logged in for the Living Atlas portal to work for you. And now we're just going to type in Tree Cover 2000 and click Enter. And hopefully you should see something like this, where you, you have a couple options. And we're going to just click on this and actually use your right mouse button. So right click it and add to current map. And this might take a couple moments, um, but then you should see it pop up in your map. And it's just an example of one of the Living Atlas files that we can use to later compare to our drone imagery or our other projects. So it's from Global Forest Watch. We can even kind of zoom in on the map if we want to. And this is just Global Forest Cover, and this is modeled. So over here in the contents on the left side, you can see that this is just red, green, blue imagery, like the drone images we're going to be using today. So it's not multispectral. And if you go to under map in your contents pane, see the tree cover label. If you right click that and you see this pop up menu, go to attribute table, which is near the top and click on that you'll see this big kind of like a spreadsheet. Many of you might be familiar with ArcGIS desktop, so this should look familiar to you. You can move this up if you want a little bit more information about this Global Forest Watch data file. You can see a lot of it's from the Hansen project, um, which is just mapping global forest cover, but there are a ton of rows. You can slide over and see some more of the information here. Um, we're just going to close that now, but that's just how you can see some of the information within some of the Living Atlas files. So that's kind of the end of our exploratory ArcGIS Pro interface. Now we're going to just save again. Actually, I'm going to... Yeah, Chippy, before you move on, a couple folks are asking questions about this looking differently for them. Okay. And tree cover does not come up for them. Okay. Um, if, if a file doesn't come up for you, feel free to just type in like tree. I wonder if you'll have more options there. And then if any of these layers pop up for you, just go ahead and right click and see if any of them will add to your current map. You might need to have a specific um, ArcGIS online account to get to some of these files. I was thinking that the global forest. Ah, yeah, Devin says, make sure you're in Living Atlas too, not in your, your portal. Yeah, good, right, all right. the way to the right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and again, you can look at some of these categories. Yes. You can kind of go through some of these different, there are some really awesome categories. So say I wanna look at ocean data, here's a ton of ocean data that I can look through. So feel free to get creative. You don't have to do this global forest cover if it doesn't show up for you. Um, but yeah, feel free to look through. There's some demographic data, which I think is really interesting, trending information. Um, but remember, you have to click back to all categories before you do your next search. Otherwise, it'll just be within the categories that you selected. And we're just doing this to show you Living Atlas. This isn't going to be critical for the processing steps of the UAV data. It's just to, you know, mm -hmm. let you know what features are available. Exactly. All right. So I'm actually going to remove my Living Atlas file. And the way that I do that over in the contents pane on the left, you see the, the Living Atlas file. I'm going to right click it. And then in this pop up window, go to the very top and just click remove. And that'll take that out of my map. 
And that sometimes can help speed up the processing. So I'll just take it out. I hope you got to see a tiny little flash of Living Atlas. Feel free to explore it um, later on. It's a really cool database. So now I'm just gonna go to the top and just save the project because we're going to minimize our ArcGIS Pro and look at some of the metadata. So if you go up to the top and you just click minimize, and then you can get to where your files are. So I saved my files on my desktop. So I'm going to double click in here. And so also, if you see any of your um, zipped up files, you can actually just delete those now if you have the unzipped version. And that should save some space on your computer as well. So I'll have to double click a couple times because they're all zipped up. Um, so again, here's my raw imagery. For any of you who weren't able to unzip this, just right click it. I'll just highlight it. Go to 7-zip and extract here and then click OK. But since we've already unzipped it, I'm just going to delete it so I have a little bit more space. And now I'm going to go into my raw imagery file, double click it again because it was unzipped. And now you should see it says there are 89 items. That means 88 drone photos and one map folder. So hopefully you have all of these unzipped and you can start exploring them. So right now we're going to open up, we're just gonna right click on one of these images. And at the very bottom, you can see properties. So click on that. In your properties window, we're probably on the general tab. If you go not on security, but on details, and you scroll all the way through it, you can see that there's red, green, blue imagery. This is all of our metadata for this one particular image. So you can see the camera maker is DJI, the camera model is FC350, which is for the Inspire drone, exposure time, focal length, this is kind of the bread and butter of how we're going to get our images to stitch. So down at the very bottom, you can see the GPS latitude and longitude. Here's altitude above sea level. Here's the name of our file. It's a JPEG where it's saved, when it was created. So these are the more specific times that you'll want. You'll notice ArcGIS Pro, when it's pulling in the camera metadata, gets the time and date wrong. So if you need correct time and date, again, come up to the origin portion of your details, very top, and you'll find the date and the time. And this is the correct date and time. So you can click that out now that we've explored a little bit of the original metadata. And see how we have this map folder right here? Double click this and then just open up this HTML file and this should launch something in your browser. So yes, the altitude is in meter. So here we have a lot of really cool metadata information. And this was created by an R package that Andy Lyons wrote. And if you want to try out any, if you want to try out this project, this um, ArcGIS project, then you can look at more data, which is just within DroneCamp website. So you can actually test out the R script on these sample data sets. So you can see he's done that on a lot of these too. You can download these, try them out, um, test out this script, and you'll get a ton of really cool metadata. So here you can see the start time, the end time. You can even hover over the map and zoom out. So maybe we can find that Lake Tahoe. There it is. You can zoom back in. So here's the flight plan. You can see how it was flown. You can switch to OpenStreetMap if you like that background better. And then if you zoom down, scroll down through this metadata extraction using that R package, you can look at the ground sampling distance. So pretty much the same. This is in inches. So you can see it's between 1.7 and 1.72 inches um, for our spatial resolution. And the altitude is in feet. So that's just above ground level when, when he flew it from the ground. So close to about 
330 feet above the ground. And most of our forward overlap is 90%, so that's pretty good. Hopefully that'll help us get really good stitching. Um, so again, if you want to test out that R package, it's awesome. I use it all the time for my drone data. You can check it out in this link in the exercise guide. And again, if you're taking this class um, and you want to submit things to your professor or your TA, there are some red questions that are within the exercise guide right here. So how high off the ground were the images? What's the pixel size, the overlap, um, and zoom out? Okay, so now that we've explored some of the metadata, hopefully we kind of understand what that looks like. We're gonna go back into ArcGIS Pro. So you can just find that, open that up again. And right now we're just gonna practice setting a folder connection. So as Maggie said, that's a really great way to just find your folders, keep everything organized, um, and know where all of your data are. So we're back in ArcGIS Pro, we're in our project. And what you're gonna do is make sure that your catalog pane is open. So if it's not, you just go to view catalog pane and that should pop it up on the right. And we might be in portal right now. So we're just gonna go over to the left in project. And now you see what Maggie was showing us earlier. You see all of these, the maps, toolboxes, databases, where it says folders, we're just gonna right click. And we're gonna add a folder connection. And so let's say I know that my data are all on the desktop. So I'm just gonna double click until I see all of my files. So here are my files. This is where I wanna connect to. I'm just gonna say, okay. And now when I look, when I use this little toggle arrow, I can see that all of my files are now connected within my database. So that's great. That should keep everything a little bit more organized. Okay, so now at this point, we're actually gonna, we're gonna start diving into the data. Um, so I can pause briefly and see if there are any important questions to answer before we move on to um, loading up our images. I'm just looking at the chat window. Um, okay, it looks like people are doing pretty well. There's a question um, about the focal length. Um, um, Jason, that I didn't quite get. The difference between focal length and 35 millimeter focal length. I don't know. Do you just mean? In the properties details of probably in the camera metadata. I'm not sure, but honestly, when I want to know more about the specs, I just look up the camera itself because um, that has more specific information about the specs. Smaller sensor cameras being comparable to a 35 millimeter sensor. Okay, so it's more of a comparison. Okay, um, so now at this point, we're gonna start our stitching process. So now we're going to go up to this top ribbon and we're on page seven of the exercise guide if you're following along. So up in this top ribbon, you might be in view right now, just go over to imagery. So here we are in imagery, and on the very left side, you're gonna click on new workspace. So you could click the top part of that. And now we're gonna start creating our new workspace. So we're gonna give it a name, let's say holding pen. You can give it a brief description, drone images from El Dorado County, California. And if you scroll down a little bit in the type, you'll see that you can actually stitch together satellite and aerial imagery. We're gonna keep it on drone. And your base map, kind of what we were looking at before, you have a lot of different base maps to choose from. I'm just gonna keep it on topographic, keep it simple. So now you're gonna click next, just right here. And this part sometimes gets a little tricky. So no worries if you have a little bit of a problem at first. We're gonna use this add button to import all of our images. So click on add. And you should see with your folder connection, click into that. And we're gonna find our raw imagery folder. So we can't just click on the first one 
because that's not where our images are. They're actually in the second raw imagery folder. And if you single click this and click OK, it should load all of your images. If you double click it, you're, you've gone a little bit too far. If you see map, just go out one. Have your raw imagery and click OK. And this hopefully should load 88 images. If that has worked for you, just give yourself a little yes click in the participants window just to see if the 88 images were able to load. Good, looks like it's going up slowly. Okay. And it might not say how many images were loaded, but you'll just see that as long as image is populated, um, you should be good to go. And if you can't find a place to put the input name, see if you can click next and get into this image collection portion. Um, so basically what's happening, I'm not sure, I hope one of the helpers can figure out why the new workspace would be grayed out. Um, I wonder if that has to do with a license or- It might have to do with licensing. Yeah, I'm guessing it's a license issue. Um, if you okay. received a license uh, through us, it should be, it should be there, but if you're using like your own ArcGIS Online account, uh, you might not have access. Okay. In that case, don't worry. Um, hopefully you'll be able, I'm providing the outputs after this process. So hopefully you'll be able to um, get the map package open anyways. So now I'm just gonna show you the geolocation. Everything was just automatically uploaded um, using the EXIF file, which is the metadata that, that are embedded within each of the images. It found the spatial reference, which is UTM zone 10 north. That's accurate for this area. And remember how we saw the camera model? It automatically populated this FC 350. So you can have a lot of different other camera models and types. Not every single one is recognized by ArcGIS Pro at this moment. So if you're using a different camera type that's not, you might need to create a camera type um, uh, spreadsheet. But for now, everything uploaded automatically. It looks like it's working. So we're just going to click Next. And this is the final page of the new ortho mapping workspace. And so you can see that it's using um, elevation source is average elevation from a digital elevation model. And ArcGIS Pro is able to just figure out where they can source this DEM um, to create this new ortho mapping workspace and put all the images in the right place. We're gonna estimate statistics. And if you hover over the little I, um, this is information, so this is just helping to display this new image collection that we're making. We're going to keep everything else the same, so our band combinations like the RGB, that looks good. Pre-processing, um, you can, I'm not going to check those today, but I'm sure you could in the future. And so now we're going to, once you have everything looking like this, I'm keeping everything default, you can just click finish. And this should take maybe a couple minutes, but it's going to start creating a new ortho mapping workspace. So if you're following along, we're on page nine of the exercise document. And what this ortho mapping workspace is doing is it's creating an image collection. So it's adding in the images, it's putting in, it's pulling the metadata from the cameras, uh, from the camera's photos, it's estimating statistics like the cell size values, and it's building an overall boundary of all of our photos. So this isn't an actual ortho mosaic. The positions are not perfect, um, but this is just the first step in getting to that beautiful ortho mosaic, beautiful positioning. So here in this logs area, you can see what they're doing, what ArcGIS Pro is doing. Um, so it's going through the 88 uh, mosaic data set and it's just creating some of these statistics like the cell values and cell sizes. And you can see that some things start to appear in your map. Um, 
Also, your contents page is a bit different now. So this might take longer or shorter for people depending on their computer. My computer usually takes a, a bit of time, so hopefully um, this is what your computer looks like now at this point. So if you're in your contents pane, notice that we have a bunch of new options. We have a lot more flight data, so the camera locations are all of these little yellow squares. All the loads on and off. The flight path is this orange um, line that we saw previously. That's what Sean flew on that ranch. And the image collection, so these are the actual images. If you click that off, the boundaries for each image disappear. You can click on this red boundary, which is all of the images, the overall boundary. And if you actually zoom in a little bit, the images should start to appear. Right now, we're just going to click on one of these yellow camera icons, and you should have a pop-up window. So notice here that you have the image name, so this is the fifth image, the latitude and longitude that we saw, the altitude. However, the date taken and the time, remember how I was saying the correct date and time are in your metadata? For some reason, with the newer version of Arc Pro, this has not been corrected. I think it's because of the exit files and the camera metadata that's being pulled in through ArcGIS Pro. This might be different on different cameras and different drones. Um, I have reached out to Esri to try and correct this, although they haven't gotten back to me yet. Um, so I don't have an answer for you, unfortunately. I saw that comment a while ago. And yeah, if I think, um, Ronald, if you could mute your mic, that would be amazing. Thank you so much. So yeah, just, just take a note that your date and time will be incorrect just in these little information pop-ups. You can always go to your camera properties, your metadata within your actual files to figure out the date and time. Hopefully Esri will figure out this bug pretty soon. So you can close that pop-out window, just click the X. And now we're just zooming into our map because we want to see how this new ortho mapping workspace has placed our images. So if you just zoom in a bit, you can see, oh, look, we found a ground control point. That's what they look like, these little checkers. Um, so you can see that that portion looks pretty good. It might take a little bit of time to load some of these images, but they should load as you're kind of scrolling over the map. You could just use your mouse to drag around. Um, but if you really zoom in, you'll see, oh, here's a great example. The images are not actually aligned. They're not stitched up. They're not in their perfect locations. These are just a first pass, get the images on the paper, and then we'll start our process. So to actually stitch the images, the things that we have to do include finding key points. So here's a camera location. Here's, um, here's where one of the photos was taken and it has a bounding box. So we wanna have our tie points be the same location in multiple photos. So the tie points are automatically created by the software as Maggie mentioned earlier. And we'll need to run a tool called adjust to actually kind of fit these up a little bit better. We're not gonna run this tool right now because it took my computer 50 minutes with these 88 images. So don't actually run this tool, but um, you can look at the adjustment options and we can talk about those. Don't click okay after <laughs> you open this up. <laughs> uh, playing Russian roulette here. So basically this, these are the options for your adjust, your block adjustment, getting those images in there in better positions before you create your ortho mosaic. So the initial resolution factor, this is the default. This is eight times your source resolution. So that means it's eight times less than your source resolution. That's how it's making its initial adjustment. Um, if you have surfaces like water or something that's a bit more ubiquitous like sand or even grass, you'll probably want your source resolution to be something closer to three or four, so you'll have a little bit higher accuracy. The GPS location accuracy, high means that it's between zero and 10 meters accurate. 
medium, I believe is between 10 and uh, 10 and 20. Low is between 20 and 50 and very low is above 50 meters accuracy. So the default is high and that's where we're going to keep it. And then this maximum uh, residual is basically that's how much you can have um, outside for your tie points. So you want to have a lower residual so that you have higher, um, higher accuracy for your tie points. And you're going to perform the camera calibration. That's usually checked and that helps kind of correct for the distortion. So do not click OK, because that'll start your adjust process. Just click this X box to close it, or you can click Cancel. Great. So now we're just going to save our project. Um, we're going to pretend that we clicked the Adjust button and just save your project right here. And we're actually just going to close it now. So you can close that down. And now we're going to imagine that we just ran the tool. Chippy, do you think it would be a good time for a quick bio break? Since it's the bio, I was going to do the bio break in at 2.13. Um, once we, Sorry. yeah, keep, keep going. It's, it's coming up. It's coming up. Um, so save and close that. Pretend that we ran the adjustment tool. And now click back into your main data folder. And we're just going to look at the adjustment report. And that's a button you can click after you've run the adjust tool. So there were a couple screenshots in Maggie's um, presentation previously that she showed us that included some of these outputs. So the adjustment report is after you run adjust. It has the number of input images and adjusted images. That's great. So it adjusted all the images the number of tie points, so those locations within the image that appear more than one time within each image. The solution points, so these are like the actual adjustments that are happening within the images. The reprojection error, so this is kind of like your root mean squared error. The ground resolution, so about 4.5 centimeters, um, that's our spatial resolution. Adjustment type frame is specific to drone imagery versus satellite imagery. And we did not run ground control points. So when you do on your own time, this should change to a yes. So you can just browse through this, look at some of the tie points, the solution points. If you look at the multi-ray, that just means that it appeared in more than one, the same location appeared in more than two images or three images. So basically the more rays, the more multi-rays you have, the better the solution points. So you can see it goes up to 13 rays. Um, you have some projection errors that you can look at, some of the distortion parameters here, GPS. And then these are a couple of the screenshots that Maggie was showing before. So these are the GPS adjustments. And then here are the cross matches. So these are the matching the tie points. And as Maggie said, the darker areas are where there were better matching, so better tie points and if you notice, this center area doesn't have as many tie points, so we might notice that it doesn't stitch as well. We'll see in a moment if that's true. And then the overlap, as Maggie mentioned, the outer edges do not have as much overlap, whereas this center area has a ton of overlap, as we would expect. So maybe we'll have a little bit more error on the edges. Okay, great. So now that we've gone through that adjustment report, we're still going through our exercise guide. And now we are just going to be, if you want to answer some of these questions for homework or just for yourself, go ahead and do that. So this is the last thing we're going to do before our five minute bio break. Um, you're just going to double click on your map package file and allow that to load. So I just want to make sure that this works for everybody. If you double click it directly from your data folder, it will open up and launch ArcGIS Pro. And this is a map package that shows what your data should look like after you've run the adjust process. So once, once your images have gone through that initial adjustment. Okay, great. So now's a good time for a bio break. Um, also, we can do a quick Q&A if people want to stick around. 
So let's say our bio break goes until, let's say 11.08. So yeah, just get this map package up and running and we can do some Q&A right now. So now you can see we're in this ortho mapping workspace area. On the contents area, we have everything that's already been adjusted. So not an actual ortho mosaic, but just about. Things have been positioned and put in almost the right place. Um, we're just gonna look at some of the things in our table of contents now. So at the very top, ground control points. This is something that I added so it's not gonna automatically pop up when you open up right after you run that adjust button. But um, this is just the ground control points that Sean laid out. And I just wanted to give a visual representation of kind of where you can put those when you're actually conducting your mapping in the field. So it's good to spread them out. It's good to have them usually kind of a couple around the corners and a couple in the middle spread out, not under trees, very easy to see from multiple locations um, from your drone. If you keep going down in the contents pane on the left, you can click on solution points. And this is gonna populate, you can see the residuals, so kind of our, the outcomes of these different adjustments. Um, you can click those off, there are tons of those. We don't have any GCPs pop up, even under the ground control points because we haven't actually adjusted them or created them yet. The tie points, those are all the locations that are the same within multiple images. There are a ton of these and these were how this initial adjust process was able to run. These were generated by ArcGIS Pro. So you can click those off, you see there are tons. And we've already looked at some of the camera locations and flight path and our image underneath. Great, so now we're gonna zoom in a little bit more into the ground control points. So right now we're on page 12 of the exercise guide. So let's find one ground control point, let's say maybe this top one up here. And we're just gonna zoom in on it. And now we can see, oh look, here's one of the ground control targets. So this is a target that Sean put out before he flew he put a GPS and recorded the lat long just in the exact center of this checkered um, square. And so he was taking really good positioning so that this dot will eventually land right in the center of this if we were to adjust this image. So the way that you would do this, although we can't do it now because we haven't run the adjust process, Basically what you do is you run the adjust process on your own computer and in ortho mapping in this refine area, you click on manage GCPs. There are three different options. You can import the GCPs. So we provided a CSV file that should be ready to go. So you can import that here. And then you can open up your GCP manager. Obviously it's grayed out right now. So you'd have to run the adjust process to do this. And then you can basically just start finding photos that have these targets in them. And there's a little plus sign and you just click exactly in the middle of each of these targets. And that will shift, it should shift these um, purple dots to be right in the center. And then you rerun the adjust process by clicking right there. And you can find your adjustment report to see if it improved your stitching accuracy. So we're not going to do that today, but again, there are detailed instructions in the appendix starting on page 26 or 27 if you want to do this with your own data or with this data after you run the adjust process. Okie dokie, so now we're on 3.0, page 12 of the exercise guide. So we're just going to pretend that we've run the DEM tool, which will create a digital elevation this is really great to create your digital surface model and your digital terrain model, which we're going to explore in a moment. And we're also gonna pretend that we ran the ortho mosaic tool. So this is the actual ortho mosaic that we've been waiting for. After we did our ortho mapping workspace, after we did the adjust process, this is our final 
single map that we're going to be looking at in just a moment. So pretend we ran through these wizards. Again, all of the parameters, everything is written out for you in the appendix at the end of this exercise guide. You wanna try this out after you run a just. So now we're gonna add in some of these final products just to explore them. So we're gonna go up to the top ribbon here where it says map. And we're going to go to add data. So right there. And we're going to find our data. So since we're in a new map package, unfortunately our folder connection no longer exists. So we go to the desktop and go and find our data. You have to click in a couple times. Get to this area where you see final products. We're gonna double click that. And we're just gonna use, we're gonna highlight one, hold shift, and then click to the very bottom. That'll highlight all of them at the same time. So hopefully everybody has these all highlighted. They were able to find their data in the final products folder. Once you have them all highlighted, you, you can just click OK. And again, you can only run the GCPs after you've run the adjust tool. So now we have a couple of our layers, but where are they? If you go into the contents and you scroll down, you'll see that these were added in our reference data. So scroll down all the way here. And if we wanted to look at the very topmost layer in our contents pane on the left, you right click it and then you just go to zoom to layer. And that should zoom you out to where you wanna be. So now we see our actual ortho mosaic, one of the products we've been waiting for, our digital terrain models just underneath that and our digital surface model is just below that. So we see them all right now, but we just want to focus on one. So we're going to scroll up a little bit, make sure that you're in this list by ortho mapping by entities on the very far left of your contents and go up to reference data. So right here in contents, you're going to right click it and we're just going to say turn layers off. We want to just turn everything off. Awesome. So the first thing we're going to look at is our digital surface model. So our DSM down here, you just put a check mark in it to see the visibility in our contents pane. And then you're going to highlight it. We want to change the symbology just so we can kind of understand what we're seeing in our surface model. So you're going to right click that, go up to symbology, and that should open up the symbology tab. This might be kind of familiar to you who've used ArcGIS Desktop or ArcGIS Pro. So here we're gonna go to Color Scheme and we're gonna click this little arrow. You should get a big drop down menu. And we're just gonna scroll down. I like to use this one called Elevation Number One and it looks like this. If you hover over it, you should see the name of it pop up. Feel free to use whatever your heart desires, but for this example, we're gonna use Elevation One. And hopefully that worked for everybody. I'll wait just a second for people to catch up. Now we're just gonna do the exact same thing with our DTM file. So here we are, we're just gonna highlight it here. We're gonna click it on in the contents pane on the left. And if your symbology is gone, you just right click, go to symbology. And then in color scheme, we're just gonna do the exact same thing. So just drop down. Scroll down until you see some of these elevation layers, elevation 10, elevation 11. So up here is elevation one. I'm just gonna click that and it automatically changes for me. And now I'm gonna exit out of symbology. And now here's a little red question mark in the exercise guide. What do you all think is the difference between our digital surface model and our digital terrain model? You might notice that there is quite a bit of difference. So here you can see the values. It looks like their base value, the minimum, is fairly similar, but their maximum is off a little bit. So the terrain model has a lower maximum than the surface model. And when you look at the surface model, you actually see that it has these higher values and kind of more pronounced regions. 
So the surface model is just showing you everything that's above ground, so your trees, your buildings, your objects. Whereas the terrain model is just that bare ground layer. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, feel free to read into that a little bit more. There's some good documentation on the ArcGIS Pro website. But we also want to see our ortho mosaic layer. So here it is. In your contents pane, just click that on using this check mark. And now we're just going to explore this layer a little bit. We want to zoom in. So let's take this little area. We can just zoom in with our mouse. It looks like we see, maybe that's a greenhouse. We see some buildings. Looks like pretty high resolution. We see some cars, we see a lot of trees that are different colors. We see that it looks like the stitching process actually went fairly well. These roads look like they're stitched pretty well together. But remember how we didn't have very good tie points in the center of the image? Notice this crease in the imagery. So that's one area where if you were going to redo some of your ortho mosaic stitching process, you might want to focus on some of the images here in the middle. You can use the, the GCPs, so hopefully this ground control point would help out with that. Um, for example, in this ground control point, when you do some of those adjustment processes, hopefully it would help out with this center area. And also notice that we have some dead trees right here in the middle, which might be a result of bark beetle infestation or drought. Um, so we're going to note these trees in the center when we do our vegetation analysis in a few minutes. So now that we've explored our ortho mosaic, our digital surface model, and our digital terrain model, we're going to move on to a canopy height model. So first, just going to click Save. And I'm going to see, are there any questions from the helpers that I should address right now? And where in the process was the DSM created? This was just done in the ortho mapping area. After you run the adjust tool, you go into this DEMs button, and that's where you can select the digital surface model and the digital terrain model. Again, after you run the adjust process on your own. And this is all found in the appendix if you want specific parameters. Um, that's also where you can find the ortho mosaic. Okie dokie. So save your work, um, make sure that it's good to go. Now we're going to create a canopy height model. So this is basically looking at the elevation values from the ground up. So we want to look at how tall are the trees or other objects within our map. So within the analysis tab, in this top ribbon, we're in analysis. And if you go all the way over to the right where we were exploring earlier, we're going to click on raster functions. So as Maggie said, raster functions are awesome tools for rasters. So they're not for vectors like points, lines, and polygons. They're for our rasters, our continuous data, um, like these images that we have here, this ortho mosaic, for example. So you can see there are a lot of different types of raster function tools. You can do really quick processing for krigging, for thresholding, um, statistics, but just remember that the outputs do not save in your geodatabase. They will, they will show up in your contents, but you need to actually import them to your geodatabase um, to save them there. For today, we're just going to be exploring them, so no need to save them. Right now, we're going to type in minus into the search bar. And that should pull up arithmetic minus negate in the math section of our raster functions. So we're just going to click on the minus button, and that should pop up this tool. So if you're following along, we're on page 15 of the exercise guide. So in our parameters, what we want to do is basically take our digital surface model, which is from the ground up, and we want to subtract out the ground, the bare earth layer, which is our terrain model. So our first raster is going to be our digital surface model or DSM, and raster two is going to be our digital terrain model, or DTM. And we're going to keep everything else the same, just the default values. And once you have that DSM 
DTM, we're just going to create new layer. And that should show up immediately in your ortho mapping contents pane. And look how quick that was. Usually doing this in your geoprocessing tools, that might take a bit longer. Um, although if you're doing actual analysis, we would recommend using geoprocessing tools. That'll save better and it'll actually do a bit more of a thorough job. But for these purposes, visualization, these tools, raster functions are amazing. So now we want to visualize this a little bit better. This is our canopy height model already calculated for us. So you can see these values. Some are negative because of the differences in the way that we processed the digital surface model and the digital terrain model. So kind of our radius for how big we wanted to search out to um, include within these models. And you can look at these parameters in the appendix if you're curious. But what we're really focused on are these um, the maximum values, so kind of the above ground values. But we want to be able to make a little bit more visual sense out of this canopy height model. So we're going to change the symbology, and we know how to do that now. So you right click in your contents, go to symbology, and now we're just going to go back to elevation one in the color scheme. So we're probably fairly familiar with that. Looks like we found elevation one. So it looks like our really high values are in white, and then the lowest values or even the negative values. Looks like they're in the pockets. I wouldn't really count those as accurate values for this case. Um, so disregard these negative values. But look at the highest values, the ones in white. Um, it's still a little bit hard to see this elevation profile, so we're just going to use something called the hill shade to really boost that effect. So we're going to go back into analysis, raster functions on the far right. And instead of the minus, we're going to look for hill shade. So you can type, type that into your search bar. And it's part of the surface tools. So you can just click on hill shade. And here we want to select our minus output. That's our canopy height model. And for the hillshade type, instead of traditional, we want to change it to multi-directional. That'll give us a little bit more of this visual representation of elevation within our canopy height model. Now we're just going to create a new layer by clicking on that button. And this should show up immediately in your ortho mapping contents pane. So hopefully that's working for everybody here. You see your hillshade. And now we're just going to drape our canopy height model over our hillshade. So the first thing you're going to do is try and drag this minus file up, but it, it won't drag when you're in the entities mapping list by ortho mapping entities. So in your contents pane, just go one to the right and do list by drawing order. Now when you take that minus file, you can just drag it all the way up to the top. Great. So hopefully everyone was able to do that just in list by drawing order, drag your minus file up to the top of your contents pane. Now what we want to do is change the appearance of this canopy height model. So in the top ribbon up here next to analysis, if you go over past ortho mapping, go into appearance in this top ribbon up here. Now, if you go a little bit over to the left, make sure that this file is highlighted in your table of contents. You could just click it once. Then you can start to change the appearance with this little layer transparency slider. So all you do is you just slide it over. We'll say about 50% and you'll watch the transparency change. So click it up one more. Okay. So now you can see there's a little bit more of a 3D effect on our elevation. This is just a 3D representation of our canopy height model, which is pretty cool. We want to see how tall the trees and objects are within our canopy height model. So there's another little red question mark in case you want to answer that on your own. But right now we want to know what are these features that have that are the tallest points within our map. So in our contents pane, we have our minus file. It's at the top. It's 50% transparency. 
we're just gonna scroll down a bit until you see the hill shade. We're just gonna unclick that so that hopefully you can see your ortho mosaic below. Make sure that that's checked on so that you can see it. And now what we're gonna do is use a really fun tool called swipe to see below our top layer. So we're still in the appearance tab of the top ribbon and really close to this slider transparency tool just below it, there's a tool called swipe. So if you click on that, your mouse should appear in kind of a, a little triangle. If you click anywhere and hold it on your map, you should be able to see what's going on in the layer below. So make sure that we don't have any other layers checked on. And we're just going to use this to try and figure out, let's see, what other layers might be on. I'm just going to check off some of these other layers to more easily see what's below. And use your swipe tool. Hopefully it's working for you. Sometimes they get a little stuck. I suppose, let's see. If this guy isn't working for you, that's not a problem. We can still kind of see below our canopy height model to where the white values are that are really the highest values on this map. Chippy, it's because you have your DTM selected in the uh, content. Ah, thank you. Oh, that's perfect. Okay, thanks so much, Robert. So make sure that your minus file is selected in your contents pane. And then when you click on your map, it does a cool slider effect so you can see what's right underneath it. So check out some of these areas over here. You can zoom around. And it looks like some of these areas are trees, even dead trees. So kind of a fun tool to play around with. If you don't want this swipe tool on anymore, you can go up to the top ribbon and go into map and just click on explore. And that gets rid of that tool. And now you're back into your normal um, mouse. And then we can go back and see what these values are by just clicking on, see this, this part that has a high elevation value. And right here, the pixel value will tell you 23. Okay. So that seems pretty high given that our maximum is 39. Here's 25. Feel free to click around within your map. But if you're not sure what the value units are, you can close your pop-up, go back to your minus layer, just right click it, go down to properties. And then when you go into source, just here on the left, looks like the vertical units are meters. So that's one way to kind of figure out the canopy height model values within your map. Cool. All right. So we just went through canopy height model, trying to figure out values, the tallest objects within your map. And now we're going to save our work and maybe take a couple questions before we launch into a quick poll. Let's see. Are there <laughs> hashtag we love swipe? <laughs> yeah, swipe is a pretty cool tool. I guess I just have to remember to highlight the layer within the contents pane for it to work. So are there any other questions um, right now before we move on to a quick poll? So quantifying change, um, that's a really great, great question. I guess we talked a little bit about that in yesterday's session. Um, if you want to quantify change you and you want to do repeat flights, number one is figuring out your mission planning and flight plan. Um, and flying the exact same place throughout seasons or years. And then you can just calculate this canopy height model using the geoprocessing tools. Um, and you can even create polygons or regions. You can create a raster region within those maps to see your areas of um, highest elevation or lowest elevation. And you can do some differencing or subtraction to see those differences among the seasons or years. Okie dokie, so make sure everybody saved their map. Um, so now I'm going to ask 
if the if the Zoom moderator could pull up the poll. Perfect. Okay. So go ahead and try and answer this question. Don't worry if it's too tricky, we can talk about it. So subtracting the DTM from the DSM, the canopy height model, which we just did, can be used to find the mean sea level elevation of the area, the height of above ground features, or where water would collect during a rain event. I'll give you just a couple more minutes. Okay, this is great. Looks like we have a ton of answers coming in. And it looks like we have about 96% think that the height of above ground features, we have 2% in mean sea level elevation of the area, and about 3% think it's where water would collect during a rain event. So great job, everybody. The answer is canopy height model. We'll show you the height of above ground features. Oops, <laughs> sorry, I'm clicking to share results. Um, so hopefully you can see those now. Yeah, so the mean sea level elevation, that would probably be um, those values that we saw earlier on, like in the 1000 range. Um, and where water would collect during a rain event, that was a little bit of a trick question because we did see some of those negative values in our canopy height model. But that was more of a, uh, that was more of due to the way that we process the DTM and the DSM. So it's not exactly accurate enough to be able to calculate that in this example. But what we were showing was that you can really see the height of above ground features. So looking at canopy height. Awesome, great job everybody. Seems like you're doing well with the content. All right, so your project is saved. Now we're gonna move on to vegetation health assessment. So this is using that index that we just talked about earlier on, VARI. Um, so we're gonna do a really quick analysis of that. So in your contents pane, click off all of your layers except for orthomosaic. So we're just gonna go through, check off all of them except for just your orthomosaic. And that's the only one you should see within your map. Make sure that this is highlighted within your contents pane. And now in the top ribbon, just go into imagery, which is just right in the middle. Go to indices all the way to the close to the very far right. Click on that down button. And then you'll see we have tons of options here in ArcGIS Pro, which is really cool. You can do stuff with burn ratios. You can look at geology. There's some really great water indices. And up here, these are the vegetation and soil indices, really useful. So things like NDVI, you have to have multispectral imagery to be able to calculate that. But the VARI is sort of that NDVI equivalent with red, green, blue imagery. So we're just gonna click on VARI. And this is where you tell it which bands are what. So my red band, in this case, yep, looks like the red is band one. The green band looks like that's band two, and the blue band looks like that's band three. And then ArcGIS Pro is going to do this calculation using the equation I showed you earlier, just in the background. So if you click OK, you automatically have your VARI result. Um, and if you can't see it, just scroll on up to the top of your contents and you should see it there. So pretty cool, pretty quick with raster functions. You can always do this in your geoprocessing tools raster calculator. You can actually do the equation using your different um, bands. And that's actually something that Irina is going to do in her workshop on Thursday. So if you're interested in that, check into that workshop. It's going to be really cool. So now we're back in our contents pane. We want to get a visual representation, understand sort of the healthy vegetation within our map. So in our contents, we're going to right click and we're going to go to symbology right here in the middle. That's going to pop up. 
And we're pretty familiar now with the color scheme drop down. But now instead of, instead of using the elevation one, we're just gonna drag this all the way down to the bottom and use your wheel to just spin it about once. And this is where I really like to use the red, yellow, green continuous um, scheme. So you can just hover over that to see that name, select that, and you notice that it's giving our lower values a red color and our higher values a green color. So that's exactly what we want in this scenario. I'm gonna close this out. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look within our map to see what's actually healthy-ish vegetation and what's maybe considered not as healthy vegetation within this context. So what you can do is either toggle this Vari layer on and off, if you would like, or you can go back up to our beloved swipe tool. So up in the top ribbon, we're gonna go over to appearance again. We're gonna click on this swipe tool. Make sure that your Vari layer is highlighted in the contents pane, and then just click and hold and drag it throughout your map. So we're actually gonna zoom in. You can also do it this way if you like. And notice that some of the dead trees in the center, looks like they do not have very high index values, meaning that they're not exactly the healthiest. And we're pretty interested in some of these. You can see even the green right next to it is coming up as pretty green. But what else do you notice? What is getting the lowest values? If you notice, let's find an area that has really dark red. So it looks like that's some shadow. So this is just a really quick analysis for vegetation health. However, if you're doing a proper analysis, it's important to get rid of the noise within the data. And that's something, again, that Irina is going to talk about in her workshop on Thursday. Um, but since this is just a really quick intro into using some of the raster function analyses, we're not going to get into how you remove shadows and mask out um, some of the ground layer. This is more of just a visual representation of what your vegetation health analysis might look like. So now we're going to save your work. So just go up to the top, click save. And now we're going to create our map so that we can export it. So we're going to create a map layout. The first thing I want to do is in my contents, I'm a little bit too zoomed in. So I just want to right click and I want to zoom to layer. So now we have a nice view of our Vari layer. We also can see that our ortho mosaic is right below it. So to create a map layout, we're going to create two separate maps, one with the Vari layer and one with the ortho mosaic. So now we're going to find our ortho mosaic. You might have to scroll down a bit. We're just going to highlight that. And we're just going to right click and all the way at the top, it says copy. So you're just going to select copy. And now we're going to open up a new map. So in the very top ribbon, next to project, you'll see the map tab. And then next to that, you'll see the insert tab. In the insert tab, we have a new map. So just click on that. That should open up a new map right next to your holding pen workspace. And then in this contents pane, right under drawing order, there's something that says map. It might say map, map one, map two, map three. In my case, it says map three. So I'm gonna select it, I'm going to right click it, and I'm going to paste. And this should bring my ortho mosaic right into this map. I don't really want a base map for my final um, layout, so I'm just gonna unclick this so that I have this white background. Now I wanna have a separate map for my Vari layer. So I'm gonna go back into holding pen, this workspace right here. I'm gonna scroll all the way up to my Vari layer, highlight it, right click, go up to copy, and then in insert, I'm going to click another new map that's going to open up this new map. 
And now, again, in the contents where it says map one, two, three, four, just going to right click and I'm going to click paste. And again, we don't want this base map layer in our final map, so I'm just going to unclick the topographic portion. So now I see that there is nothing here. It's just a white background. We have our Vari layer in map four, in my case, and I have my ortho mosaic in map three. Again, yours might say map one or two. So now we're gonna insert a layout. So in this top ribbon where it says insert, we're going to click new layout and you see there are a ton of different options. What we pretty much use, or I pretty much use these top two rows. And for this, we're going to use the landscape one because we have two vertical maps and I want them to fit nicely within my layout. So I'm going to click on this landscape letter and that's going to open up a new layout on the side. So once that's opened up, we just want to make sure that the rulers and guides are on. So up here in the top ribbon, we're going to go to layout and it looks like, okay, yeah, our rulers and our guides, which we're going to make in a second, they're on. So that's good. In the vertical ruler on the left, I'm just going to create a couple guides to keep my map really nice and organized. So right around the number seven, I'm going to right click that and I'm just going to add a guide. So you see how that blue line just popped up? That's one of our guides. So now I'm going to find the number 1.5. I'm just going to right click that and I'm going to add a guide. And if you sort of hover over it within this ruler, you can move this line however you want. So now we're on seven and 1.5. That looks pretty good. Now in the horizontal ruler at the top, you're just gonna right click on 0 0.5, add a guide. Right around 5.5, add a guide. Right around 10.5, we're gonna add a guide. And again, you can hover over it. You can even right click. You can remove the guide if you don't like it. So this looks pretty good to me at this point. Now we just have to add in our maps. So in the top here in this ribbon, we're gonna to go to insert <clears throat> and we're gonna to go to this map frame. This is where you can actually insert your maps. So remember that my map, I had a map three and a map four. So I'll just scroll down to where I see my ortho mosaic. And you see it's in, for me, it's map three. I'm just gonna select that. And then the way I bring it into my map is I put my cursor, I'm gonna put it on these guidelines. I'm just gonna drag it across until it lines up with these other guidelines on the left side of my map. So that looks pretty cool. It looks like it's in the layout that I want. So I wanna make this map content bigger. So what I'm going to do because if you notice, if you try and scroll, it scrolls your entire layout, not within the map itself. So to actually scroll and make my map content bigger, I'm gonna go to layout at the top ribbon. So here we are in layout. I'm gonna go all the way over to the right and there's a button called activate. If you click on that, it highlights my map content. And then I'm just gonna use my scroll bar to just scroll in, zoom in. You can also use these zoom buttons up top. And once you find a good space for your map, then you can just, okay, that looks pretty centered. That looks pretty good. And now I'm just going to say, go into layout again in the top layer once I'm done formatting and just close the activation. So now I'm back in my map layout. I can click around, I can move my map layout um, back and forth. Now we just wanna do the exact same thing with the Vari layer. So we wanna insert map frame, and now we're in map four. Get that Vari layer, click on that, drag that across to our guidelines. And then again, what we have to do is go into layout at the top ribbon, go into activate, and that'll activate our map. And then we can just kind of move it around, zoom in. Okay, it looks centered, it looks pretty good. In the top ribbon again, go into map layout, 
And then you can just close that activation once you're done. I don't know if you can see, but there are actually these borders around our two maps. So say we wanted to get rid of those. We're on page 24 of the exercise guide, if you're following along, 5.12. If you highlight this one, hold shift, highlight the next one, we have them both highlighted. You can right click, and then you can go to properties down here at the bottom. I'm just gonna close my raster function so I have a little bit more room. I'm gonna pin my catalog. So over here in our format map frame on the right, there's a little drop down arrow and it says border. So I'm just gonna click on that one. And over next to gallery, if you click on properties, that gives you the properties for this specific border. And I'm just gonna make the color no color, so that top option. And I'm just gonna apply it. So either that way or you can click this apply button. Now when I'm back in my map, I'll click on it and it looks like there are no more borders, so it's looking a little bit cleaner. Now we wanna add the North Arrow, Scale Bar, and Legend. So we're gonna go up to this top ribbon. We're going to insert. And over here in this insert tab, come over to the North Arrow. Click on that, you have a bunch of different options, so feel free to choose your favorite. You just click on, I usually click on this one, and then to get them to appear, you have to drag them out. So just like your map frames, you can adjust it, you can put it in a corner, make it bigger or smaller. We're gonna do the exact same thing with our scale bar. So up here, scale bar, I usually click on the first option as well. I'm gonna drag that kind of towards the center and maybe format it so that the units are kind of nice and round. 0.4, let's see if I can get a 0.5. Okay, that looks great. I'll move that up a little bit. And now we wanna go and add a legend. So make sure that your Vari layer is highlighted, which it probably will be by default, that you only get the Vari legend. Now I'm noticing, okay, it has kind of an interesting title. Maybe I don't want that exact title. So if you're in your contents pane, you can just click on this title. Maybe we just wanna call it Vari. You can rename it, click enter. And that should actually change the title right here. And then I also like to get rid of value. Um, you could put index value, you could change it, but I usually just delete it. And then that should appear on your map. You might need to change it within your holding pen before you do a final export to get rid of that um, as well. So this is looking pretty good. We have our north arrow. Maybe I'll center that a little bit more. We have our scale bar and we have our legend. So looking pretty good. We have our maps in the right place. We have our guidelines helping to keep everything organized. Now we're just gonna add a title. So we're gonna go to insert and up here, there's a button that's called Rectangle. So you just click on that, and then you drag this across the top. You'll see a little text will highlight right there. So I'm just going to type right into it. I know you can't see it very well, but holding pen, ortho mosaic, and vegetation analysis. So I'm gonna unclick that. So now that it's highlighted, you can always change it right here. Holding pen, ortho mosaic and vegetation analysis. Right click it, go into properties so that it shows this on the side. And if you go over into text symbol at the very top, you should see a couple options appear. So we have appearance, position, there's rotation, halo, shadow, a couple different options for your text. So in appearance, we're just gonna click this drop down. We like the Tahoma and the regular, and maybe we'll just make it size 30. And actually, maybe we will make it bold. And you won't see anything until you click apply. So that looks pretty good. Maybe I'll make it Maybe I'll just make it 29 so that it can fit within my title. Okay, that looks pretty good. And then if you scroll up a little bit, we can just 
click on appearance so that it disappears, and then click down on position. And then in the horizontal alignment, we just want to go into center and click apply. That looks pretty good. Now we'll click back into our map and maybe you'll want to move it down a bit. Feel free to move it however you see fit or rename it however you like. Um, or the mosaic vegetation analysis. That looks pretty good. So now we're just going to export our map once we're pretty happy with it. So all you do to export it, as Maggie explained earlier, is you just go up to the top ribbon and you go to share. And then where you see this layout, you just click on layout. And then I like to save it as a PNG. You can rename it here. It's going to save to the desktop. So I'll name it, let's just say, um, let's say ortho vari. And it's going to be 300 DPI, so pretty good resolution. And then you just click export. And that should export directly to the place where you saved it. So as this is happening, you can just save your work by clicking up here, your save button in the top. We can check if that was able to export. And it looks like it did export to my desktop. So we have a nice, um, we have a nice exported map. You can send that to your friends and family um, of your vegetation analysis and your ortho mosaic. So a couple next steps that you can do, again, compare this ortho mosaic with your base map um, from a different base map or some of the living atlas files. You can look at ortho mosaics from the PIX4D workshop. You can compute slope and aspect, um, and you can measure the distance and area and even the volume of some of the features in your map. And then just as a reminder, if you're interested, you can look through all of the full data processing steps. And this has specific parameters. These are the GCPs. This is your digital surface model and digital terrain model. And this is your ortho mosaic. So highly recommend looking through those running the actual adjust process on your own computer. It will take a long time, but then you can start playing around with some of these outputs and parameters. All right, so I guess we can do maybe a quick um, Q&A before we break for lunch. <laughs>